So we are now officially live. All right, so I'll go ahead and take care of the chat and uh, Andy and Anshu, you can go ahead and get started. Thank you, Jamie. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Anshu Agarwal, CEO and co-founder of Nimbella, a serverless cloud company. And it is my pleasure to introduce Andy Thuray, who is a technology influencer and a, techno uh, and a thought leader. His focus is on emerging technologies such as cloud, AI ops, AI ML, edge, and IoT. He is a trusted advisor to many startups and enterprise executives and is also an avid blogger. Prior to starting his own practice as field CTO, Andy was at IBM as the cloud chief strategist and at Intel as group CTO for the API group. Andy, it is great to have you here with us. Thanks for having me on. Enjoyed our previous discussions. As Andrew said, I'm Andy Thurai, founder and principal at uh, thefieldcto.com, home of unbiased emerging tech advisory services. Hopefully I can add some thoughtful comments and value to your listeners. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Thurai or at thefieldcto.com. All right. So uh, for the audience, um, this talk is in a discussion format, and we had asked our audience to submit their questions during registration. We got some questions, and I've included those questions in this discussion already. But if you have any other questions, please feel free to type in in the comment section, and we will address them during this conversation. So Andy, let's get started. Well, let's see how tough your audience is, or are they really taking it easy on me with questions? <laughs> All right. OK, so um, the first question, and it is around this definition of serverless, because the mm. serverless definition is evolving. It is different from what it was four years ago and to what it is now. So how do you define serverless? Is it still fast or a more comprehensive one? Good question. Uh, good question to start with. It's actually funny. I, I was having this conversation with one of the C levels just a few days ago. Uh, for some reason, the name FAS has become somewhat synonymous with uh, serverless, serverless and serverless compute and serverless architecture. It's almost like you know, in the old days, we used to have uh, uh, called photocopy machines as Xerox machines and, and you know, lip bombs or chopsticks and, and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, buds as Q-tips. It's kind of like that kind of branding has happened too fast. So everybody thinks, you know, uh, a serverless architecture is nothing but fast. Um, you know, <clears throat> funny enough, there was a, 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 I believe it's a CNCF survey that I was looking at on the other day. An interesting fact, fast or functions as a service can be used without using serverless architecture. I don't know if many people know that. Server surveys suggest also about 50% of the fast users don't use serverless computing. They just use function, functions as a service, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so there are, there, are, there are things that, you know, that, that uh, so the whole idea of serverless came up, not just recently with, the, with the, the newer functions as a service, but again, it's been around for a while. If you go back to the, the web and mobile days, um, you know, they remember they started the whole uh, backend as a service or mobile backend as a service. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's nothing but serverless compute, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, fast is just a uh, how shall I put that newer reincarnation of it. But but the older days, the database as a service, the storage as a service, the the whole database management or messaging and push notification, remote updating, the, even the user authentication, uh, the the storage and hosting. I mean, there are companies that made a living off of that for the better part of the decade, right? I mean, Firebase, Azure, even, you remember the company called Kinbay? They, they made a living out of this, right? But now the newer incarnation or the newer portion of that has brought in the, the functions as the service, which is obviously popularized by Amazon, the Lambda, and then the Google functions and, and Azure functions, and, and IBM also has a functions variation. Um, so as I was telling the guy, because FAS is so popular, it has become more like a fast and furious. Get that? Okay. Yeah, I guess. Fast and furious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, but serverless adoption is uh, in nascent phase even today. And where do you see serverless being popular and why? What is the reason? Right. So that's... If you want to think about it, in order for you to go 
as a either as a service or backend as a service or serverless or even becoming fast you obviously have to be doing your entire architecture primarily cloud native based or cloud native right yes. yeah. it doesn't have to be public cloud i'm not suggesting you have to jump in with two feet and go to amazon or someone else you could also do private cloud there are companies that are like you know i don't want to go through a whole laundry list but there are companies that will offer you to build cloud native architecture in your own data center so mm -hmm. you need to figure out who's right for you but in order for to do this take advantage of any of this you you have to start out with the cloud native first so obviously it's very popular with the cloud native companies yes. it's a bad idea if you have a monolithic application and want to, want to make it serverless you know without using some of the the cloud native concepts that's going to be a problem right mm -hmm. uh, and so as far as the applicable use cases wise there are quite a few of them but there are a couple of them i can talk about which which is uh, i mean if you want to and if you have time there are, there are a couple of use cases i can talk yeah about. absolutely yeah okay yeah. so one good place um to do this would be um any function that can be standalone without a tether to the major application that could be made as serverless or functions as a service a classic example would be again i'm or simplifying the fact here but if you have created a model in ai and if you distribute the model to the edge and if you want to do some kind of inference to an extent it's somewhat of a standalone model inference unit a function Okay. And then, depending on how many requests you got, you could scale up and down. And keep in mind, one of the other things people miss in that is your functions as a service doesn't have to run in a centralized cloud location. It can also run on an edge location. Yes. So location is is not an issue. It's it's transparent. You you can run the function where you want it, when you want it, how you want it, and and do it as close to the users as possible. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why if you look at it, uh, <clears throat> Amazon made an announcement as well. I believe Cloudflare, um, they have been doing pretty big on this uh, the fast serverless area as well. Uh, they were promising customers that uh, I believe they have, what, uh, 200 data centers around the world now in 90 countries, somewhere along the lines. And they said, you know, if you have a function that you want us to execute close to the customer for especially for edge, edge fabric or this kind of inference at edge locations, Mm -hmm. We could distribute it anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then, so if you're doing an inference from a specific country, you don't have to come to the central location to make an inference, which avoids two things. One is the latency issues. The second, yeah. most important is the privacy, governance, GDPR, all of that, because your function and your data. In other words, when I was at IBM, we used to have this concept when we were forming this edge fabric group. I was one of the, I was the initial strategist for that, that concept. Um, so my boss and I came with this idea saying that uh, in the current scenario, even though we claim to be a data economy, database economy, we still move data to where the compute is. That's right. Uh, become that, which yeah, is that, a problem, right? That is a challenge, yes. yes it, it is. Absolutely. So instead, what we were proposing with the edge fabric and this function services that are really where you want is to you move compute where the data is, where it's needed. Yeah. Because the computers become so portable, so cheap, so easy, you don't have to bring all the data. So in other words, the the, the phrase my, my boss coined, which I love it, I, I use it everywhere I go, he, he claimed that instead of moving volumes of data with less value, move the value of data with, with less volume. Okay. <laughs> so you flip it basically. So what you do is that you, you got a ton of data at edge, uh -huh. Move the compute to where you want, as a, in the serverless architecture. Yeah. Do all kind of things what you want. Mm -hmm. Move only the insights and value from there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That 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 could be a good use case. I mean, there are. I could. I mean, I could go on and on. I mean, another classic example that I was talking to a, um, a antivirus malware company, and then uh -huh. one of the things he was suggesting was pretty interesting. I never thought about it. This use case. Technically speaking, the malware detection in any workload, you could use that as a function because it's a sort of a standalone function if you think about it, malware detection in the workload. Mm -hmm. So that can be created as a function 
that function as a microservice get bolted on or added to any enterprise application. So instead of an application calling a central server to do a malware sending the workload, you could embed that into a container or in a serverless architecture as, as a bolt-on as a function. So it's a separate function, executable function, can execute by itself. That's another example. So anything that can be done by itself can be done as a function. Well, that's that's that, those are great examples. And in our experience, what we've found is, as we talk to more and more developers, that popularity of serverless in its current incarnation is with companies that are developing modern cloud apps, okay? And we are going to get to enterprise after this. But we also see a pattern developing where a developer once starts using a serverless, a, server, a serverless framework and platform, and they never want to go back to anything else, which strengthens our belief uh, that serverless is here to stay because serverless can be extended to all different kinds of workloads. And you gave two great examples, which are more enterprise centric rather than just IoT, where you have an event and you trigger a function but it's more complex workloads. So that brings uh, brings me to the other, uh, to the question that mm -hmm. I, that's kind of the heart of this uh, conversation uh, is about adoption, that serverless adoption is in app development companies. There are lots of case studies that people can find, but you talk to a lot of enterprise executives and where do you think the adoption curve is within an enterprise? And we'll go, we'll go into details, you know, why is that and what can be done, okay? Right, right. Um, so, so, so here's the thing, right? The, the developers, the, the ones that are building the apps, they're already drinking the Kool-Aid. They know how easy it is. Look, if I'm a developer, the last thing, especially I'm, I'm talking about the enterprise app developers. Again, I don't want to categorize them all together. There's uh, infrastructure developers, there's, you know, all kinds of developers everywhere. Um, I'm talking about the enterprise app developers. Um, they are good at writing code to solve a business problem. And they are not good at, you know, managing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I mean, the obviously, the, the, the infrastructure as a service or infrastructure as code, all of this concept came out to make it flexible. But they don't know, based on their app, how to, to make it happen. And... And some of the tech executives are almost at that level. I'm not talking about a code, but uh, they don't understand the full, uh, how you can implement the serverless in my environment, and make it better. So there's uh, some education needed, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, some evangelism needed. Uh, the same way that, you know, we needed evangelism on, on how to use cloud computing a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, everybody was scared. Everybody thought, what is this cloud you're talking about? Even some of the big executives, says, you know, came out and say, I don't get cloud, remember? <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, I do. So, I mean, a lot of these companies are still in experimentation phase with some of these newer technologies. Uh, but if you if you are if you have a big enterprise app, um, you know uh, that's running in your data centers, it's not just easy to switch it back and forth. It's not like you know I, I just scoop the whole thing up and then dump it in the cloud location. It's going to stop work, right? Uh, there are a lot of dependencies, whether it's a database, messaging, middleware. Uh, so. It's you know for a classic legacy application to to move it, it's going to be a little bit difficult. So you need to build all the supporting cast and components uh, to move before you move to cloud. Or the other option is obviously you know you could you could you know if you're a cloud native company, for example, you know companies like Uber or Airbnb or Lyft or any of those companies, yeah. when they start building everything, or even LinkedIn for that matter, when they start building everything in cloud. They use the components that's available to them in cloud, but then the ones that are not available, they just build it rather than yeah, yeah. going looking for companies. And that's how all this, um, you know. And again, they people with innovative ideas come and, and you know build a company, and that becomes a Silicon Valley unicorn. I mean, think of companies like Confluent, which is an idea of event-based paradigm messaging. And then they said, okay, you know, there was a specific problem at LinkedIn that they couldn't solve it. They solved the three engineers, solved the problem by building that, and then they came out and, and started a whole company out of that. So, you know, if you're a cloud native, there are other options. Not only that you can use existing components, but you could build things easy. But if you're a full enterprise, it's a little bit tricky, right? Um, so the other angle is that, you know, when when you explain to the, when, when, when you tell them you got to go completely cloud native or move to cloud when, when they are a little skeptical about using these technologies, particularly serverless and others, 
you show them the TCO on ROI, when they look at it, immediately they'll start to explore. When you say things like, you know what, how much money are you sending on server, servers or managing a data center or, or managing infrastructure or managing any of these things? Mm -hmm. It's some of the dollars. And you're building new set of enterprise applications. What if I can do it at a fraction of a cost, 10%, 20% when they look at it? Obviously, you know, you can't just pass, pass up. You'll have to explore that, whether you adopt or not, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Um, I think a um, lot of time developers spend in managing infrastructure, so they don't spend in value creation, which is writing business logic. And uh, one thing serverless offers them that they only have to code business logic, but there are things missing. And that's where I want to come to is what would it really take for enterprise adoption to take off? What is missing? Um, and um, just uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I, I don't know if the enterprise adoption is uh, low. I mean, um, especially given that this technology is, uh, is very new and it's still evolving and maturing, I mm -hmm. think it's fairly well progressed given what okay. it is compared to other technologies, right? Absolutely. For example, you know, the, the report I was mentioning earlier, um, that says that 50% uh, of the AWS users are using Lambda services, right? And the Lambda services usage and serverless and functions as a service is growing at a 75% annual growth. So if you think about those numbers, it's progressing really fast con compared to other technologies, right? But yeah. having said that, there are some sort of stopping factors for enterprise adoption though, because, you know, again, it's not like, you know, you're in an experimentation phase with some of these companies. For example, if I, um, I don't want to pick on anybody and say names and, and upset people, but but they have a bunch of um, pages that has only reviews. And if somebody clicks on it, the review doesn't load. Actually, matter of fact, I was checking a website this morning for something, I forget what it is. Uh, after multiple clicks, it wouldn't load. It just was sitting there doing nothing. And then I said, fine, I just give up, I'll come back later. But if you are an enterprise app, you're trying to process something in a supply chain or, or you know, or a HR system, or, or benefit system, or financial system. That's not an acceptable answer because my web server or cloud or, or function didn't work. Come back five minutes later. That that's not an acceptable answer. It never is, right? So so there are factors that you need to consider. Things like you know, uh, resiliency available all the time, uh, and and statefulness, which I'm sure we'll be talking about later. Yes, uh, and and latency on you know uh, when you start up a function, how long it'll take the startup time frame, uh, you know, and and the fact that you know the functions are very uh, ephemeral functions, mm -hmm. and, and because of that they are kind of stateless, and and so how do you how do you have enterprise applications which requires affinity because all of those enterprise applications cannot just work in a vacuum, they need yeah. some sort of a state. How, yeah. how do you how do you solve that? And then there's of course there's a this classic issue of uh, you know the observability of uh, how do I how do I you know uh, if the functions are ephemeral and comes in and disappears in a matter of you know seconds or minutes mm -hmm. I need to get insights from those things you know so as as new issues come up obviously you know uh, there are new companies come up to solve that for example the observability and monitoring uh, none of the enterprise companies move fast to solve that there are companies like you know. I'm sure you know some of these names. Companies like uh, Dashboard, Tundra, um, you know, Epsagon, or IO Pipe, or, or all of these companies are doing a big observability solution on 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 solving serverless monitoring issues. Yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. And, and and then you know, then obviously the the, the other major one people don't think about is uh, security. Uh, if you misconfigure a server, someone else configured the server for you. I mean, that's a, there's a misconception that when uh, you and I talked about it, when people say serverless, people assume that there is no servers. It's just not your server. I mean, there are servers somewhere. Somebody okay. else configures it. Like somebody else's like responsibility. Right. It's somebody else's responsibility. It just abstracts the, the thing. Yeah. What if they misconfigured? What if uh, if there's a data leakage or, or you know, the, the, the developers, uh, unless they practice some sort of a, you know, good uh, code hygiene, as they call it, uh, if you write a poor code, and then if you have a misconfigured security flaw, you're asking for a disaster. So there are companies like PureSec and others who are born to solve that issue. 
Yeah. And the uh, stateful is another major issue for enterprises. And that's where companies like you, Nimbella, and, and a couple of others in the market to solve that issue. So it's gaining adoption. There is a missing tool set. And of course, the cultural views need to change. Uh, but it's growing fast. But on that note, there are companies decided to go on board 100%. I was reading a case uh, study on the other day. Netflix uses uh, uh, Lambda functions as a service. Unbelievable. You know how many how many hours of video they process using using Lambda? I I I was baffled. I was shocked to see that they process seven billion hours of video using Lambda functions. Or at least that's what I saw in the report. That's wow. like if you had to use a regular server app function to do that. Cost-wise, imagine how it expensive it will be. Yeah, so your, your monthly rate will be 99 bucks per month, not seven bucks a month. I don't even know what they charge now. But <laughs> Yeah, companies like Net Netflix have mastered the cost equation. And we'll talk about it uh, because you, you did a wonderful blog on the cost thing. So we'll come to that. Um, just wanted to uh, actually um, just briefly talk about, you know, when my founders and I started Nimbella, we started with the premise uh, that serverless platforms have to support enterprise. For this to be really successful, they have to support enterprise workloads. And for that, there was an important capability that was missing, and that was support for stateful workloads. The platforms that are provided by big cloud vendors are meant for stateless workloads. That doesn't mean nobody can develop stateful work, uh, stateful applications, but it becomes a developer responsibility. So it's not the entire serverless story that can be used there. Um, but that, that was one of the main reasons why we got started. So can we elaborate a little bit more about the statefulness? Uh, why is statefulness so important for enterprise? And uh, why should anyone use it? Are there any benefits of using server? This was, uh, this was an important question um, from an audience, from the audience that had come in during registration, is like, Anyone, why should anyone use serverless for stateful apps? I mean, are we using technology for the sake of technology or is there a benefit to use serverless for stateful apps? Uh, so is the question more like, do we use stateful or, or stateful versus stateless serverless? Is that a question? No, so the first is why is stateful so important for enterprises? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the next one is, are there really benefits of using serverless for stateful applications? Should we just do it the way we were doing it? But are there real benefits? And you've touched upon quite a few, but if, if you yeah. could boil it down for our uh, viewers, that would be great. Sure. So, I mean, serverless, as we talked about, so let me talk about serverless. That's what we've been talking about for a while. Uh, serverless in itself abstracts. Um, so just to give you an idea, right, in, in the cloud space, the way we started off, it's somewhat backwards. We started off as SaaS was the most popular, well, technically speaking, before SaaS, there were MSPs, which managed everything for you, which is kind of like a hosted cloudish application of, of uh, yesterday years, right? And then you yeah. started SaaS, in which they'll take out of the whole thing for you, all right? The, the application, you, I dump it in there, you don't have to worry about a thing, you know, Salesforce and other companies became so popular because of that. You don't have to worry about a thing. All I need is your data. Everything else, we got it. Don't worry about it. So that's that's became quite popular. And then after that, almost at the same time, your pass and, and infrastructure as a service has become popular. So so in in, in SaaS wise, I take care of everything. In pass wise, you know what? You develop an application, I'll abstract the infrastructure from the whole nine yards for you. You drop the application and I'll run it for you. Not just the data, but also the application you develop, the logic. And then of course you can go as much as the IAS level saying that, you know what, I, I want I want all the flexibility. I want to do everything on my own. I'm a control freak kind of level, right? So you could, you could go to infrastructure as a service. Yeah. And then when people started developing that, like I explained earlier, it became an issue suggesting, oh, wait a minute, this is a little too much for me. I need, you're saying I need to provision this and that and everywhere, it, it's a little too much for me. Can you abstract one level up? Because people think it's a lot easier to build an application using containers it comes with its own set of issues. Oh, absolutely. Me, all right. <laughs> how do you how do you drop applications to containers and have the, the container ready for you to deploy the deployment, management, configuration, testing, data leakage issues, 
how you have a container ready at the time for you to deploy, where, version control, manageability, orchestration. Of course, Cubes is helping to an extent Kubernetes, but it's all a humongous issue. It, yeah, so it, is said, it is a skill set. It is a skill set. It it is a skill set, and that's what people are learning fast enough. And and then they say, you know what? No, no, wait, wait. wait. I mean, as as people do when it comes to in whether it's compute or political, people tend to swing from one side to the other. They swing to SaaS, and then all of a sudden they swing to IaaS. They're like, wait, wait, wait. The happy medium may be somewhere in between. So I don't want to do IaaS. Can you give me one level up? Then this whole notion of this. Uh, the the CAS as I call it, container as a service, which is somewhat in between infrastructure. You don't have to go that level to manage. I'll just manage the container level for you, uh -huh. but you don't have to go to the platform level. We have a little bit more flexibility. So those things came up, right? And then and then people said, wait, I, I do that, but I just want to execute a certain business logic and function on top of it. So then the fast concept came up, which is somewhat above pass in my mind which still abstracts the whole nine yards. All I need is your business logic and application, give it to me, I'll take care of it. So the bottom line is that what serverless gives me is, I don't have to worry about any of my infrastructure complexities, procurement. Remember, I, I don't know how long you've been at it, doing these things and data center and all that, but probably by saying this, I'm dating myself here, but remember the procurement cycles and data centers used to last that's the, the the blog that you and I were talking about. It could take up to six months to eight months. The budgeting cycles start about a year before when you actually need it. So several of solves almost all of those issues, saying, you know what? I don't care. All I need is I want to scale at this location by this much. My load is this much, so I want to use only this much. Mm -hmm. And then I want to expand it, and I pay for what I use. If the function is sitting idle, I'm not going to pay for it. That's the whole idea of serverless. Pay as you go, don't pay for idle, the whole nine years. That's the great thing about serverless. But then the downfall, as you talked about, is it, it's not stateful. So if I expand that into a, a million functions, all of a sudden the site, that million functions require state, so they're gonna hit the database. So imagine what will happen to your database when you have uh, a thousand or ten thousand or a we are talking about millions when whenever you go web thousand is nothing right so we are talking about million ten million hundred million functions that spun off requiring state hits your database what's what do you think is going to happen to your database Bottom so this this can expand but then here's the pipe is small so probably nothing will happen because your database is dead now right yeah, so yeah. so obviously statefulness not only having expansion of functions is important, but making it stateful without killing your database is an important thing. So that's obviously an issue with serverless. So that's where server, I mean, stateful can help. Mm -hmm. And the related issue is, I mentioned this earlier on, you pay only for what you use, mm -hmm. which means if I use a function and I let it sit idle, I'm not paying for it, and it's only fair that uh, I, I call that a cloud provider's server eviction notice or our evict your functions. If it is not used, I believe AWS used to have a limit of five minutes. If my function is not used in five minutes, it's going to evict your function. And the next time when you require to use that, you have to ask them to restart it, which means, which is the, basically the cold start, which means there's an overhead involved mm -hmm. in dropping the code and having it ready. So yeah. there are platforms and and, and best practices to make sure how you keep your um, you know function warm and ready rather than you know doing a cold start maybe you know do some synthetic function in between mm -hmm. there are other things you could do so yes. you know so there are issues I mean stateful is not I mean serverless is not necessarily a miracle solve it all it has its own issues so mm -hmm. as long as you are able to solve that you got to get the best of both pay as you go expand crazy you know do millions of transactions pay a small amount but then combine this with the enterprise characteristics that combining both, yes. then probably have a good solution in your hands. I know that's a yeah. lot, sorry. <laughs> no, it, it certainly is. There are, there are challenges with the current serverless and, that, and that's what I was mentioning, that we, st we got started because there were these challenges. And one of the challenges that you mentioned is there's so many developer tools that you have to assemble, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it's monitoring, tracing, debugging. So everything becomes developer responsibility. So now you are jumping from using 
uh, from what you thought that you'd only code logic and now you're trying you're not only assembling but you're also managing state because as you said that compute will expand okay it will scale up and scale down but your storage becomes your responsibility so it is really important to have the locality of compute and storage together uh, because we run into that latency issue which is more uh, more difficult in the cases of enterprise workloads okay yeah well then then there's also a related problem of saying that okay i i figured out how to solve all of these issues and i build this entire thing in one cloud provider platform uh -huh. And then some of it is fudge, some of it is real. People come and say that, well, you're locked in. Are you not worried about being locked in? Are you not going to move to Google? Oh, okay. Then you have to start another wild goose chase saying that, okay, no. And the C level will come and say, oh, I got to have both run in Amazon and, and Azure and Google at the same time. Give me a multi cloud and or hybrid cloud with my private cloud environment. I need to have that. And, and the first question I ask them when they say that is, what exactly is the need? How often are you going to look to move your workloads between Azure and Amazon, right? They're like, almost never, then why do you need multi-cloud? I mean, I'm not saying that nobody needs it. I'm not saying that you don't need it. It, it depends on what your scenario and situation is. If you're going to be, and this is a classic example, if you're going to be building a stateless servers, it doesn't come out in a vacuum. You got to use other things like you, you might have to use Kinesis, you might have to use uh, storage. That's all tethered to Amazon's other services. Mm -hmm. So if you just worry about building a serverless, what about the equivalent functions? Does the other cloud provider offer that? How mm -hmm. are we going to port between that? So if you want to truly build a cloud native in both clouds, you know how much of a time and energy you're spending in both? I'm not saying you shouldn't. But you need to be aware of that before you start into that engagement. And after knowing that, yes, I know all of that. I understand all of that. I still need that. Fine. That's your choice. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, uh, the thing is, anytime you build for a certain cloud, you are tied into a cloud vendor API system. Okay. And that's why you need to choose a solution which will actually take you across clouds. So you're abstracting the cloud vendor specific APIs. You're still using the physical aspects of these clouds. These clouds are battle tested. I mean, you would want your infrastructure, you, you would want your application running on the physical infrastructure of the cloud, but what stack you want to run in each one of them so you get the benefit, that's important. Okay. All right, um, you touched upon containers and uh, mm -hmm. container adoption actually has taken off, okay? And uh, what I want to discuss on where serverless falls with container adoptions and containers, as we know, is mainly driven with the success of Kubernetes and has taken a large market share. How do you see serverless fitting into this trend of container adoption? Or is it just so, a natural progression? <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a natural progression, or I, what I what I call it as a evolution, right? Okay. Um, so if you think about it, um, so what about uh, 50, 60 years ago, um, mainframe was predominant, and then the smaller and mid-range servers came and replaced them, mm -hmm. and then the the virtual machines VMs came and replaced them to to timeshare that, mm -hmm. and then which got replaced by containers. You know, yeah. the, the Docker containers, it's a lot of work, but, you know, I mean, if you ask anyone who's building a containerized app, they'll tell you orchestration, security, governance, deployment, management, even destruction of, you know, how do you destroy your containers that's not being used? Mm -hmm. Too many issues. Yeah. Yet, yet we're all fully 100% on board with that, you know. Um, so that's one set of issues. But then... That's why people, a lot of, obviously, you know, the, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. So a lot of people saw, including startups, including cloud providers, saw that, you know, hey, everybody seemed to be struggling with that. Maybe there's an easy way to solve. And that's where this whole serverless and stateful serverless notion came up. You know what? Don't worry about any of that. Just, just give me an app code and I will execute it for you when you need it, how we need it, where it's needed. Right? And, and disappears. I, you pay only for the small time that you're going to use. What's better than that? So it, it's an evolution. It is going to come. But I'm not saying that you know that's going to replace the whole nine yards. I mean, at the end of the day, we still have mainframes. We still have COBOL applications running, right? Mm -hmm. So they all have their time and place. Uh, and 
and this is really given what what it gives you the flexibility particularly with the with the combination of uh, agile development developing everything as a microservices and functions and pay you as go run as you need it's a combination of things that's that's changing the marketplace so yeah i, I see a ton of enterprises getting into this even though they are careful and slow especially with the, some of the issues you said uh, security vendor lock-in uh, they are worried because they want to do it right which yeah, is sure. always the case with the enterprise uh, whether do i want to be the first or do i want to be right so it's a tough choice tough choice all right do, do you see a world where serverless plus containers will meet the needs of all customers or <laughs> we still have mainframes it may not be the I, was, I was going to i was going to ask you the question i mean i could say it potentially but but can you tell me the day in which uh, mainframes and cobalt cheese to exist remember when was it 20 years ago year 2000 was a major issue the world is uh, going to yeah, end yeah. because of cobalt programs <laughs> what happened we, everything is solved we are still you know fine and dandy so it never went away so something else new come up i mean now we are in a, in a event based paradigm messaging based uh, and and stateless execute when an event happens kind of a paradigm that's the new paradigm now and and for the data based economy because we are not in a compute based mode i mean compute based mode required heavy iron uh -huh. but now we are a data based economy so we need the compute power of our small or big it is where the data is so so when you combine the database economy with the statefulness and the event driven paradigm i guess that would solve some of the the things what the enterprise are looking for to do now but i i i unfortunately don't have this magic wand or or you know the the what do they call the globe glass globe to look into the future i wish okay. i could <laughs> Well, um, see, nobody should adopt a technology because it's a trend, okay? It's a wrong reason to adopt. And, uh, but I I firmly believe because I I am in, I, we started a serverless cloud company. So I, believe, I firmly believe that there are real benefits that an enterprise can derive from this computing paradigm. Mm -hmm. And you, you talked a, a whole bunch about it. But what is, you, I, I'm assuming you also believe that there are lots of benefits for this. But do you think company enterprises are going to adopt because it's a trend and you know nobody wants to be left behind or they are going to adopt because there are real benefits? Or I mean how they are going to jump in into this? It's funny you ask the question because when I go to customers um, to advise them the first question I ask them is exactly that. Do you want to do this because do you think it will make your life and your developers life and your company life better? or you want to do this because everyone else is doing it you you want to drink that kool-aid you want to be hype and then the other cio cto round table you want to say we are we are doing serverless we are doing statefulness we are doing cloud we are doing containers we are doing kubernetes what's what's the main reason and you know some it's kind of answer is all over the place 50 50 and when somebody says it's because i want to look cool then i really question their motive right uh, like I said, you shouldn't because it's it's a technology trend or a hype or 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 even just for cost savings alone uh, mm -hmm. that you should start building something because if you build it for cost savings alone, if the technology changes tomorrow, if something better comes up, what are you going to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you need to believe in this. I mean, you you have to believe that this is the right model for my enterprise. If I do it this way, my life and our developers and oh. and. Uh, Ops guys' lives will be much better. So you got to build your enterprise around this because building a cloud native solution, especially when you have an existing one, you got to port it. Not building the new companies, cloud native companies, when they start building it, they don't build the whole thing in in one day. As I say, Rome is not built in one day, right? They build pieces of it, and then when they need more things, they slap things on it. But if you're an enterprise, you already have an existing application, mm -hmm. a humongous monolithic application which does something. So when you move to cloud, your your customers will expect you to at least be at a minimum of what you're already providing. Beat that, right? So if you do the cloud computing or serverless in the whole nine years, the whole delivery model shifts. For example, you know, you'll have to you will have an architecture, a development and a release model that'll use a newer set of technologies. And and you got to make sure that it all fits within your, your organization and culture. 
just don't just throw in a bunch of technologies because you want to look cool. You know, have a plan, have a strategy, make sure it fits your culture that you want to become that culture. Otherwise, you'll be like, as I say, you'll be riding two horses. You, you have no idea w- which one to take, and then you'll fail miserably in both. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. All right. Um, so, uh, Andy, there was a blog you wrote maybe a couple of weeks ago on enterprise application cost modeling and budgeting using serverless computing. Could you give our viewers some insights on your findings and uh, what would you caution about it to our viewers? Okay. It's funny. So um, that's actually the, you're talking about the one that I wrote on Newstack, right? The, the that's correct. controlling the application uh, cost infrastructure. So, so um, it's actually came as an offshoot of a uh, conversation I was having. So I was going to write a piece on that and I was having a discussion with the city level executive. And then when we were talking about it, and then it just thought came to me saying that, you know, what what is what are people using serverless for? They are just using it to set the uh, same things like, you know, I want to scale my architecture, I want to pay as you go, blah, the whole name yes. But a hidden aspect that everybody forgets is that you could use this to set your upper bounds for the application. I mean, cloud computing is known for that, but this can even take it to the next level at a granular level, suggesting, you know what? I could pick application by application. Let's say my benefits application. During the benefit enrollment period, there is no upper bounds. You can use all at once. You can expand all at once, use as much compute power. That Mm -hmm. need to be alive alive for people to use it. That's my number one goal. But after the benefit enrollment period, there is no need for it to be running at all, if any. So you could set the limits. In other words, depending on there's, I also joked with them, depending on if, if uh, some of the BU's guys are being jerks, they're not paying your bills on time because it's always, <laughs> IT is a cost center, right? So you got to yeah. charge back to people to make money. So if you yeah. if you charge them back, if they push back and question on them all the time, clip that application. Make sure that, you know, they, they understand the pain. You know, they later on, when you go and ask for that, they will be ready with cash for <laughs> you to maintain that application. So you got to build a relationship with BU's saying that, hey, you know what? I'm going to be supporting your application. I need this much money to support your application to run the level you want it. They say, no, no, I can give you only half of what you're asking for. Then I'm going to set the limit as half. If it exceeds more than that, it's going to slow down. And when they come, they ask you questions. So basically, there are ways to control application costs in a granular level using state stateless or, or serverless architecture is what I'm trying to say, which is nobody thinks about it, but yeah. that's actually an added bonus and benefit. That's yeah. end I wrote that article. Absolutely, yeah. especially with the warring tribes within a large enterprise. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Um, so um, the serverless platforms that are provided by big cloud vendors, and we have talked about them, uh, they are all proprietary. So there is a vendor mm-hmm. lock-in, lock-in which you trust, uh, which you talked about. What are your thoughts on open source platforms, and do enterprise care about open source? Yeah. So. Um... Really? There's a vendor lock-in? I didn't notice it before. I'm just <laughs> So, I mean, the vendor lock-in can come in many ways, right? I mean, you know, obviously the API lock-in is one of the ones on how you call them could be a major issue. So, obviously, you got to use something to abstract your API calls. Um, and, you know, the the when you execute functions, particularly serverless functions or functions as a service, um, you know, what are the cloud provider services that is tightly coupled with? For example, if you're using a serverless function and if it is connected to Kinesis or, or an Amazon storage, as I mentioned earlier, then you're tied to that vendor anyway. So you can't just take the function and execute it somewhere else, right? Uh, obviously, Lambda uses Kinesis, but not Kafka. So if you want to use Kafka, is Lambda is your right choice, right? Uh, it's not just those two, right? I mean, the lock-in can happen at multiple levels. Could happen at a database level. Could happen at the middleware. Could happen at the messaging. Could happen at the streaming. Could happen even at the programming language if some of the providers don't do it, right? So there are a couple of ways you could avoid it from what I've seen. Again, this is my two cents. Mm-hmm. Um, there are frameworks you could use uh, to, instead of you know going to the serverless execution directly on the cloud providers, you could use uh, frameworks such as uh, serverless.com framework is, is a fine one. Uh, it will allow you to distribute the workloads and or, you know, execute the functions across the cloud platforms. Or oh, uh, they could and, use Zendela. I'm sorry? 
Oh, yeah, or, or, or use an umbrella. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a, that's a, you know, so to, to abstract a layer, I was getting to it, but you jumped it. But uh, so you could abstract a level. So instead of, you know, going directly to the cloud provider and execute it, uh, you could use, uh, you know, uh, providers like serverless.com or an umbrella. Or, you know, the CNCF obviously is working on, on a, uh, a standardization. So when the standards come across, Maybe the way you invoke uh, APIs, uh, the way you invoke functions could all be standardized. So if you are able to point to one cloud provider, maybe tomorrow you'd be able to point somewhere else, um, you know, maybe able to execute it. I mean, it's not there yet, but, uh, but you know, obviously the, the cost of multi-cloud hybrid cloud and, and the careful design to run on multiple platforms can be a lot more expensive than worrying about lock-in and migration cost itself in, in, in my mind. Okay, so Andy, we are all out of time. There is a okay. question from the uh, audience, but we can answer it. Um, we will when we do the transcript, we can answer that one. Uh, I did want to leave with a parting uh, question, which is, um, where do you see it in five years? Where do you see serverless <laughs> in five years? Just a quick, uh, quick thought on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um... You know, it's it's. Uh, I I wish I had that magic mirror to look into five years, but uh, but uh, you know, enterprises once they realize the cost savings, you know, they they would start to change their delivery model, right? You know, the same way that they move from data center to to you know cloud, uh, the model need to be changed. And you know, and again, we are moving towards a, a database economy. Uh, so, you know, uh, the vendors are looking, I mean, the enterprises are looking in such a way to save costs here and there, right? Mm -hmm. um, the parts and pieces of it is already there. For example, you know, uh, the distributed computing, the events-based paradigm model, uh, and the database economy, not compute-based economy, right? And you move the, the compute data in, you know, move the compute to the data instead of data to the compute, right? Yeah. Um, all of these are already in place. So, you know, you, it's not like one size fits all when enterprises look at these things and, you know, what they want to decide and where they want to do. Okay. They need to to figure out, you know, what is the right choice for them? You know, I mean, in my case, the VMs may be the best choice. Containers may be the best choice. Functions may be the best choice or a combination of the best choice. Or you use like platforms like Nimbella, which will give you an abstraction layer that that you don't have to worry about doing all by yourself. I mean, the tools are evolving rapidly. So it's hard to say, I mean, the tools that, that exist today didn't exist uh, up until six months ago. And yeah. particularly the, the remote work and work from home concept has, has, has brought in a new set of quirks that people are you know, trying to solve. So uh, it's impossible to predict where we'll be five years from now or even one year from now. But I, but I think we have the the paradigm shift happening towards the data economy and then the components are falling in place and and the big enterprises are realizing that you know they all started off with the, the agility and the cost and savings but now they overcame the other issues of the security governance and other things and and they are looking at it seriously so five years from now it will be very prevalently uh, adopted and used by almost all enterprises in my mind well well, thank you, Andy, for uh, wonderful insights. Uh, we have a couple of questions that we couldn't answer, but we can will answer it offline. And um, I wanted to offer our audience, uh, we have uh, Nimbella, we have a pretty big free tier to use, but uh, for the audience today, we are offering a 90 day of our pro tier. So please, uh, please take, uh, take advantage of this opportunity. And Andy, uh, you were going to uh, talk to the enterprise uh, and offer some something that you you wanted to talk to them about mm -hmm. yeah uh, more than happy to for sure i mean you know obviously i am i'm available to discuss uh, any of these things with anybody who's interested in discussing they could follow me at twitter at andy thorai or they could reach out to me at uh, thefieldcto.com my website more than happy to talk with them advise them engage with them to see what i can do to help more than happy to do it well, thank you, Andy, and thanks to our audience today. Uh, really enjoyed talking to you. Awesome. Good talking to you. Take care. Bye-bye.